Uh, so yeah, I'm going to be talking about some work uh, that I did in my PhD at Caltech with Shongwen Jan, uh, who's sort of the main DAS guy at Caltech. So it's curvelet-based wavefield reconstruction. I'm going to be talking about some, a little bit of theory, less theory than normal because it's a short talk, and some applications to regional tomography and combining DAS and nodes using curvelet-based wavefield reconstruction. So sort of the, the perspective that we took um, when we went into this project is that handling very large heterogeneous data volumes, that means multiple different sensing modalities, is going to be a major challenge of 21st century seismology and a, a major opportunity. So we've seen things like, of course, in the early parts of this millennia, the US array, a very dense wave field based uh, deployment of broadband stations at a shorter scale, something like the Long Beach array, where you have 5,000 stations in a very small area, and you can have access to the complete seismic wave field. But these data representations, when you get them, are fundamentally still n by 1D, where n is potentially very, very large. But what we're interested in is the seismic wave field, which is a 3D or potentially 4D object, um, 4D if you manage to have access to the depth uh, resolution, which is not very common yet, but hopefully will become more common in the future. So what can we do with these sorts of very large n by 1D uh, representations to turn them into what we really want access to, which is the full seismic wave field in 3D or 4D, um, incorporating the spatial coherency that's inherent in seismic wave propagation. So when we think about that, we have to recognize that seismic wave propagation depends fundamentally on both the space and time derivatives of the wave field. So the prototypical homogeneous elastic wave equation as something like the uh, forcing to uh, the momentum on the left and then the force on the right, forces on the right. And we see that we have access, we need, in order to describe this wave equation properly, the second uh, time derivative and then also the second space derivative need to be captured in order to fully characterize what the wave propagation is doing. So if we want to understand the seismic wave field, we need to be able to accurately capture the spatial derivatives up to at least the second order, which is quite a challenging prospect. Um, seismic time series are sampled at very high rates and regularly, so really getting this you know, left-hand side of the equation down pat was like the great achievement of 20th century seismology, I guess. We now have very good instrumentation that gives us good access to the seismic time series. But when we have spatial data, we're normally sampling it sparsely and irregularly, and so calculating these derivatives is extremely challenging. Some kind of interpolation is required, um, and we need to put some prior information on our interpolation in order to actually be able to calculate these derivatives. So the idea that we were taking uh, is to use compressive sensing uh, in order to get these uh, spatial derivatives to work. Um, and compressive sensing is basically the idea that if you do some kind of interpolation that respects in this case, wave physics, or some fundamental understanding of what the signal is that you're looking for, you can get a much sparser um, sort of compressed representation of your signal. And the compressed representation normally actually works better at interpolating between very sparse data because you're using less information. Um, you, you require less information to describe the signal. So this is the first sort of example um, that Zhongwen did in 2018 um, on uh, a sort of synthetic experiment with uh, propagating Rayleigh wave in a media that had some heterogeneities in it, took these sample points on the left. You really can't see anything that looks like a propagating coherent wave. Um, but if you assume that we know that it's a wave and therefore you invert in the plane wave basis for it using compressive sensing methods, you actually get out an almost exact representation of the wave field, even for relatively high incoherent noise added to the data. Um, so this is sort of where Zhongwen was at when I got to Caltech, and he was like, this is great, we can do it for DAS, it'll be really easy, Jack, you'll do it in like six months, and it took me four years to actually get it to work for DAS, because obviously when you look at real data, it's a lot more challenging <laughs> than synthetics, and there's a lot of things like coherent noise that you have to worry about. So I'll talk about what we did after this uh, synthetic project to get it to work for real data. And very briefly, we defined an algorithm that works um, sort of in general on uh, real data in order to do compressive sensing to get out the wave field. It's basically three steps. The first thing is that we chuck out all the data that might be really bad. Um, so that's sort of typical in a lot of array-based processing. Then we transform each of the signals, each individual time trace into the wavelet domain, which is a time frequency representation of uh, the wave field. And that's because seismic signals are strongly non-stationary 
both in their frequency content as a function of time and then also the power of each frequency at each time slice. Um, so that's represented by this sort of blob there not being constant in either the period, in either the x or y coordinate. Um, and so we need to break it up into that in order to be able to do the compressive sensing optimally later on. And then we use a sort of typical compressive sensing algorithm, uh, lasso CV, to obtain a sparse representation in the curvelet domain um, for each individual wavelet coefficient in time. So we do the time domain transform first, and then we do a spatial compressive sensing on the individual wavelet coefficients. And we use curvelets because they sparsely represent propagating wave fields. They're a special type of basis function that's designed specifically for doing these sorts of things. Um, there's a lot more detail to it uh, that you can read in my papers if you're interested, but that's basically the idea of the algorithm. We do that, and then in order to get back out the wave field at any point in time, we basically just reverse the steps, um, but using any point for where we're evaluating our curvelets in order to do that. So now some applications that people might be interested in. So the first applications we did were for the displacement wave field, so just looking at the displacements directly, in this case the velocities. Um, so one nice application of wavefield reconstruction is that it allows us to use whole wave field tomographic techniques that use that are a lot simpler to implement and use less uh, sort of inverse problem machinery than are required for traditional tomography. So in this case, we looked at a single propagating uh, Rayleigh wave across the SESN array, um, calculated the wave field, and then used uh, basically the observation that if you assume that it's a, a single mode Rayleigh wave they propagate approximately like the acoustic wave equation with a known phase velocity. And you can literally just, if you have access to the Laplacian of the wave field, do a linear regression to get the phase velocity squared straight from that equation uh, without doing any real inversion, so to speak. So that's the uh, displacement data with the reconstruction. If we then differentiate it in space, we get uh, the um, orange line that we can scale by the linear regression to overlay onto the acceleration. We can see they fit very, very well, so it is in fact actually matching this acoustic wave equation. And if you do that, you can get a curve for the phase velocity that matches quite nicely the local CVMH velocity model. Um, of course, this is from just one earthquake, though, as opposed to the many, many thousands of different pieces of data that went into creating the CVMH. So this sort of thing is potentially very useful for stuff like uh, looking at seismic anisotropy measurements where you often need many, many measurements from different directions and they're quite noisy in practice, but you get a nice result from just one, uh, one event. So you might be able to improve those things um, by collating multiple events when each one of them is quite nice. And then you can get a tomography result for the whole of Southern California like that from just one event, which actually corresponds pretty well to the, the tomography model that is sort of state of the art for Southern California and required a lot more than one event to do. So potentially the really interesting thing for this group is then what can we do to do a solve for the heter for heterogeneous sensors using this wave of reconstruction idea? So what we were looking at is integrating nodes and DAS together using this methodology. Um, DAS in particular offers special challenges for representing the whole seismic wave field. That's because the channel spacing is very dense in one direction but very irregular and sparse in another direction because we're looking at strain rather than displacements, it complicates the theory of how to do this, um, how, to, how to look at the wave field representation. And often we can only access dark fiber, which is not really designed for array performance. So you can see some examples of, in this case, we really only have access with this fossil array to you know, one line of the wave field. So it'll be extremely challenging to get out real wave field information from that, except in the propagation direction of the line. So how do, we do, how do we get DAS into our measurement uh, schemes? It's pretty simple, actually, in that if we have a particular um, representation of the curvelet uh, coefficients in space, we can just turn our, uh, we, we can basically say that we're going to solve for the displacement wave field and make our sensing matrix sense strain. So we set up a linear inverse problem where we have these curvelet coefficients in displacement, and then we differentiate what would have been the displacement sensing matrices to give us strain sensing matrices according to how the DAS cable is sensitive. And so now we just have a coupled system of equations for the X and Y components of the displacement wave field, giving us the strain measurements on DAS. Um, this makes it very easy to incorporate DAS and nodes into a single um, problem because it just becomes a big linear inverse problem where we have some nodes sensing the X components of displacement, some nodes sensing the Y components of displacement. Obviously, they'll normally be at the same locations. And then the DAS 
also contributing, and they all mix together to give us these displacement coefficients. Um, I should say that normally the compressive sensing is solved by adding an L1 norm onto, the, uh, onto this linear inverse problem. So that's why there's an L1 norm here for the two curvelet coefficients. So we applied this idea to the uh, Brady Nevada Porotoma experiment because it's really currently the, the best whole wave field opportunity when it comes to DAS because it has a lot of nodes scattered everywhere and then also uh, you know, 2D sensitivity to the wave field. It has some, some volume or area to the array deployment. It's not just a line. Um, and it's also open data, which is great. And there is a magnitude 4.3 earthquake off to the... Uh, off down here, which allows you to get coherent waveforms propagating across the array that you can then solve the wave field for. So when we do that, the first thing we checked was can we get out the DAS um, from the, the DAS records from the nodal records using our methodology, because that's something that Herb Wang did just for sort of specific segments of the array that are optimally aligned so that you can differentiate two nodes to give you the DAS response. In our case, we're using the whole set of nodes and the whole set of DAS all at the same time. So these aren't necessarily optimally aligned like in Per Wang's paper. We can see that typically the um, phase response is extremely good and the amplitude response is normally pretty good in most cases. There are some cases here where the amplitude's a long way off, but actually the phase is almost exactly correct. So there's some kind of characteristic issue with the amplitude response of DAS for this particular channel, but the phase is exactly the same. So that's nice to see that you can do that. And then in the reverse, can we synthesize the nodal records from DAS, which is a much more challenging um, sort of feat to do, especially when you don't prescribe a particular phase velocity relationship between the strain and the velocities recorded on the geophones. Um, and in this case, actually, it's hard to see again because it's small, but the P wave is fit very well because it's relatively longer wavelength. The S wave is okay-ish, it's not fantastic. And in general, this is a much more challenging problem because you're trying to invert from the derivatives of some measurement to give you the undifferentiated measurement, which is quite difficult. So in, then the end goal, of course, was trying to combine the two of them together in some way. And this is sort of a somewhat confusing plot, but basically what we did was we split the nodes up into five different sections um, and took out... Um, 20, like 20% 20 each time of the nodes and use that as a, as a test case to test how well our wave field reconstruction was doing. Then from the remaining 80%, we then uh, sort of removed between all of them and none of them um, and saw how well our wave field reconstruction did at predicting the left out 20%. So it was a five-fold cross-validation experiment. And then the blue is nodes only, the orange is with DAS, and we see, especially for low densities of nodes, adding the DAS actually really does improve the ability to predict the overall wavefield response of the data to quite a significant degree. And when we consider that deploying you know, 200 stations can be as expensive and more challenging than deploying the DAS cable and also is not necessarily a, an option for permanent deployment, it's quite feasible to think that a sort of mixture of DAS and nodes in this sort of regime is potentially a useful way forward for doing wave field sensing in an area. Um, because I've got limited time left, I might just quickly go through this, but basically the idea from then was to try to use the results from our wave field sensing to correct the DAS response um, using the, the nodal stations. We did this in two sort of ways, just by naively fitting the amplitude and also by doing uh, the homogenization correction uh, suggested by Snea in uh, 2019. And you can see that the homogenization correction can give us a better wave field fit, and it doesn't do quite as well at correcting the amplitudes um, as just the naive amplitude correction, which sort of makes sense because the naive amplitude correction is only correcting the amplitudes and can't change the wave field at all. Um, but in that way, we can potentially get a better coherence between the predicted and observed DAS records um, in the array. And just finally, one of the interesting aspects that we saw was that the RMS amplitude ratio between the predicted and observed DAS was really quite spatially coherent and corresponded very well to the quaternary alluvial sediments near the surfaces of uh, in the, this part of the array and this part of the array. 
So it seems in this case that it is the local geological conditions that are responsible for affecting the DAS response in these, in these areas that are, had the worst in this bit. So we also did some optimal experimental design, which I won't go into because I don't have time, but I will just leave these key points up here. Um, you can have a look at the papers um, by looking at these QR codes. Um, these are the key points, and I'll take any questions. Thank you.